Well, <laughs> it's, a, it's a weird thing. Okay. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, let's start today's lecture. So if until now I've been dealing with um, um, abstract concepts like correlation functions, even though, well, they're not necessarily abstract in condensed matter and cosmology, if you're interested in some correlation functions, cosmology, for instance, correlations on the sky, um, nevertheless, in terms of particle physics, at least, these are not uh, directly observable. So you might have wondered uh, why uh, care about them. Well, today we'll see why that they are related to things that we can measure, uh, and specifically, the things that we will measure are called cross sections, that are uh, simple generalizations of. Uh, classical cross sections from classical mechanics, and um, in terms of uh, quantum field theory, this will be described what, by what it is known as the S matrix. All right. So um, I said a little bit um, about the S matrix. I just introduced it in passing. Today will be a little bit more precise next time even more so. But roughly, as I said, it's a matrix, that, a quantum matrix that's defined as an uh, expectation value between an initial and a final state. And there's some quantum operator that we can call uh, S. And that's specifically an S standing for the S matrix. And specifically, uh, this is the time evolution operator. Um, and even more specifically, it's actually the time evolution operator in the interaction picture. However, for the moment, for this lecture, we'll neglect this uh, um, this detail that we're actually dealing with the interaction picture, we'll talk about the Heisenberg picture. So this will be the quantum object that we want to calculate, which will be related by the LSZ um, relation or theorem. So this will relate SFI to correlation functions. And then I will show you that a cross section can be found from SFI. <coughs> okay. So here correlation functions means in momentum space. So that's, that's the plan of uh, the lecture. So first, before we go into um, the details of how to calculate that in the quantum theory, let's understand what are cross-sections. Okay. So this idea of cross sections, um, as I said, relates to particle physics. So in particular, we we have some experiments, and uh, well, there are usually two kinds of setups. The um, the initial setup that was used was for. Uh, for a bunch of particles thrown against a target. So there are some particles with momenta and then a target with zero momentum. This would have been the, the most common experiment 
uh, at the beginning of particle, theory, uh, particle experiments. But now, with the LHC, perhaps more, um, uh, more common is to have also two, two bunch of particles, both of them um, moving, perhaps moving against each other. Um, however, we will still use uh, this description first. So this is what we would call the laboratory frame. And if the total momentum is zero, I would call this the center of mass frame. Okay. Um, so let's say uh, let's say that roughly speaking, I can think of this bunch of particles as being situated in some volume that uh, is described by this box. So there's a bunch of particles in here. It's not a physical box, it's just the volume in which these particles exist. And they move with some velocity v. And in this uh, box, let's assume that there is an approximately constant uh, density rho b. And then this thing has a length lb. And then the same thing for the targets, just that targets will assume are at rest. Well, for the moment, then we'll consider also the more general case with the velocity of the targets. So rho a is L a. <clears throat> and also, we'll consider the cross-sectional area, so the area transverse to the relative velocity of the, um, of the projections and target. Um, so we will consider that to be an area A. <clears throat> All right. Um, so now to define the cross section, the cross section will be denoted by sigma. Um, we can take two points of view. So the one taken, for instance, by Peskin and Schroeder is to just state this, to just notice that um, this, the, the number of particles scattered, so let's say number of scattering events, is proportional to all of these things. So it's proportional to the density of particles, it's proportional to Lb, to the density of targets and La, and also to the area on which, it, uh, on which the particles scatter. So the cross-section then would be the division of this uh, scattering, uh, number of scattering events to all of these things to which it is proportional. So rho A L A, rho B L B A. Okay? So that's that's a possibility, but that kind of, sounds kind of abstract, so let's understand it better in a more physical way. <clears throat> so first let's see why this is called a cross section. So let's let's calculate the dimension of this thing. So the dimension of this thing it would be what? So number of sc scattering events, that's something of that dimension. One. And then uh, rho a is something one over L cubed. Is density uh, is number for volume. La is length. Then another one of L cubed and L L. 
And then finally, area, which is L squared. So this is dimension of length squared, that is, of area. Okay, so the cross section has the dimension of area. So it's an interpretation in terms of an area of something. <coughs> so the interpretation of the cross section is that um, it's an effective area for scattering around the single target. Target particle. So, so we have this target particle, and we can think of it as having this <laughs> sigma uh, cross section around it, which is the effective area into which all particles that uh, come in are scattered. And then particles that go further are not. Okay? So that's, that's an interpretation given simply because of the formula we wrote. So this is something with dimension of area. And we divide by, since in fact rho A, L A, A is actually the number of. Uh, the number of uh, particles in the in the target, right? La times a is the volume, and rho a is the density. So this is the number. So this is a um, is an area that is per target particle. So the interpretation uh, must be correct. <clears throat> and uh, well. If you have this in classical mechanics, you, um, you know that this is a good um, extension to quantum mechanics to the, cla to the classical one cross section. It, so the classical function of cross section is really this one that I described. So if you have in classical mechanics the Rutherford experiment, classical rather for experiment because at the time that's what people had um, where you have a nucleus of charge plus Z E and then Coulomb scattering around it and well in that case it's you know you calculate a, um, a kind of diverging um, angular D sigma D omega the cross section per unit um, uh, scattered the cross uh, scattered solid angle, but um, but you had really this interpretation so that um, you calculated for units unit scattered um, solid angle, you calculate the effective air area around the atom into which the particles come in order to be scattered there. Um, so, so, I don't know. Did, did any of you have this actually in classical mechanics? Yeah. How many? All right, good. So, some of you at least know. It's not really important, but uh, it's a useful picture. I say this because now, when we talk about quantum mechanics, we will have this picture in mind, even though the process is slightly different. But um, that's what we have in mind. We have an effective area around the target into which we consider the scattering. <clears throat> All right, and then we can calculate um, the cross section for a single target as the number of scattering events per time since I mean 
this notion is uh, slightly misleading because, of course, we have uh, a, usually in experiments we have a continuous stream of particles. But let's say, um, to, to be more precise, we have this continuous stream, so the number of scattered particles per time divided by the incoming flux. And flux, um, flux here really means number of incoming over time and area. Right? And then delta t cancels, so this is delta n scattered over this thing delta n incoming over A, which we call NB, number of incident particles per area. Okay? And then, moreover, phi zero, the incoming flux, delta incident over delta t. But now we can use this picture. And imagine, uh, put an imaginary box, which can be just part of it, but the part that corresponds to delta t, right? So uh, let's consider that this box is created as the velocity v travels for a, uh, as a particle travel with velocity v for a time delta t. So um, so let's say this is rho b times the length, which will be v delta t, times, uh, sorry, times a. So then this is rho b v. Okay. <clears throat> and then for the targets, we can write the same as before. So for n targets, <laughs> this number n is the density times the volume, density rho a times the volume, um, and the volume in this case is the length L a times the area, so sigma, the cross-section per number of targets, would be this thing from here, so del delta n scattered over nb, which was rho bv, times rho a l a a. Uh, no, sorry. Um, and B, what am I saying? This was phi zero, right? And uh, and then um, uh, yeah. So I wanted um, all right. So let's let's do it from the beginning. So delta n scattered over delta t. And then, uh, instead of uh, phi zero, I write um, instead of phi zero, I write rho v v. And then I divide by this n. So now I write this further as the n scattering over rho v. And here I write v delta t which, as I said, is LA, and uh, LB, sorry, and then rho A, LA, A. So this is exactly the formula that I had before. Uh, this one. Okay, so now we have the physical interpretation as really, um, the 
uh, effective area of scattering def defined this way. The scattering per time defined by income flux divided by number of targets. <coughs> And, uh, well, we can observe here that V, I take it to be the uh, velocity of these uh, uh, projectiles for a fixed, uh, for a static uh, target. But, of course, in reality, I can change reference frames. And then V actually means the relative velocity. So, it's... Just the modulus of Vb minus Va. Because the relative velocity is uh, independent of the reference frame. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and then, so this was the definition for the total cross section. And uh, sometimes it's a useful quantity if this is finite. But as we know from the example of the Coulomb scattering, this is not always finite. But what is finite and what is actually measured is a differential cross-section. So what we usually measure in this scattering experiment we measure also the momentum, or at least the direction of the momentum, um, because, well, we can, if it goes through a photographic plate or a calorimeter or something, then uh, we can just measure the direction. So measuring the direction means we measure omega, the, the um, or d omega, let me call it this way. So the um, the infinitesimal uh, angle, solid angle, with respect to the scattering point. So then, uh, um, so measure d omega, or equivalently all of these dp's. So, I mean, one thing that we would like would be d sigma divided by these dp's, but instead the more commonly used measure is d sigma for uh, d omega. But, of course, this is only in the case of 2 to 2 scattering. So this would be in a more general case. But if I have, so, so here P1, Pn means uh, final products. We have this scattering and then Um, n particles with momenta p1 up to pn. But uh, the more relevant, in, in most cases, the more relevant case would be uh, n equal to 2. And in that case, there are two variables which can be considered to be the two angles, theta and phi relative to the um, direction, so let's say theta and uh, not good at drawing this, uh, the transverse one, theta and phi, so together they make this the omega. So uh, the reason why there are two, only two variables is simple, we can count. So the scattering is fixed, there's a fixed velocity incoming, so the only things that in a fixed momentum, 
Uh, so the only variables are the outgoing momenta. In this case, there are two. And they are on shell momenta, so really only the special, spatial parts are uh, variables. The energy is fixed in terms of momentum. So this would be six components. But there's a form momentum uh, conservation for the total uh, P mu. So that gives four constraints, so two, var two variables. Six minus four is two. All right, so uh, in the n equal to two case, which is the most uh, commonly used, what we'll have is a d sigma d omega. All right. But besides this 2 to 2, there's also one more slightly singular uh, example that is relevant, which is the decay. So that would be, let's say, <coughs> 1 to n. So we have this 2 to n, with the specific case of 2 to 2 being the most relevant, but also 1 to n, which is called the decay. In the case, we have one single particle, and it decays into several. Right? Um, the decay of an unstable particle, of course. So this is uh, unstable, meaning um, there is some quantum processes, some quantum tunneling process for, for a particle to break apart, like in the case of a radioactive nucleus. So for a radioactive nucleus, we would have something like this, that the potential, uh, the potential is something like this. So there's a barrier in here. But otherwise, the ground state of the nucleus is higher than the free state for the free particles that are unbound. So that's why we have a probability of tunneling through. So in this case, um, we define a decay rate, which is the number of decays per time. and the number of particles, right? So dn of n dt. Uh, and then if there's a single decay channel, we define a lifetime of the particle. as just 1 over gamma, so that n equal n0 e minus t over tau is a solution of this equation, dn over n dt is 1 over tau. Um, but if there are several, which is the most common, then I define this 1 over tau, not as gamma, but as sum of all the possible gammas, right? So if you want sum of our individual lifetimes for individual decays. Um, but where does this, um, where does this gamma appear in a quantum process? Well, <clears throat> so we know that uh, non-relativistically, mm -hmm. 
the lifetime with uh, uh, gamma is one over tau is found from a bright Wigner distribution. That is bright Wigner resonance in the scattering amplitude. Scattering amplitude will be a function of the energy that's proportional to so it resonance means a pole somewhere this function of the energy blows up at an e equal to e zero just that it doesn't quite blow up because instead of being a true pole it's a complex pole a true real pole is a complex pole so besides this real part I also have an imaginary part So that a cross section, or um, in this case, decay rate, so, well, sorry, a cross section for um, for the energy or or uh, well, probabilities, let's say, goes like the absolute the modulus square of this, which is. Uh, e minus e zero squared plus gamma squared over four. <coughs> so this is of course a bell curve centered around e zero and with width gamma over two. Uh, so this was in uh, non-relativistic quantum mechanics. But of course, in relativistic quantum field theory, we have something similar. So instead of this form, now we have just a relativistic version of it. So So um, here, of course, this was non-relativistic because it depends explicitly on the energy, right, through this uh, formula. But if you write a relativistic uh, generalization, it's easy to figure out that what you should have is this um, mass shell pole, p squared plus m squared. And then, so the point about this instability is um, it um, it shifts it shifts the um, uh, it shifts uh, the pole that would be otherwise real to a complex one. So in here, similarly, I would write a minus i gamma, but then since this is p squared versus just energy here. I need for dimensional reasons to add something else, so I add a mass m. I mean, in principle, I could also add something related to p, but near the mass shell, p and m are interchangeable, so um, I can use m. This is anyway the behavior near the pole. And then expanding um, this around the pole, this would be p squared um, e squared um, well let's say like this, minus e squared minus p squared minus m squared right <coughs> and so this is approximately minus one divided by um, well yeah rather I should say p zero squared and then call this E p squared. And expanding this p squared minus e squared, I can write it as uh, p0 squared minus E p squared. This is p0 minus E p, p0 plus E p. 
So this is approximately 2EP, P0 minus EP. Right? And, uh, and then I still have this term, the minus I extracted, so it's plus I and gamma, then divided by this common factor that I gave. Okay? So now this look, looks like this form. So P0, I mean the energy, and then EP is this P0. And, uh, a similar formula, okay? All right. <coughs> uh, Now, let's try to go towards defining this S matrix. And the first step will be to define uh, external states that we'll call in and out states. <clears throat> so, we have to define states that scatter. So that's somewhat non-trivial in a quantum mechanical system because in, in an interacting system uh, the particles interact and in quantum field theory particles interacting means even their number is not fixed, right? They can, uh, you have quantum interactions means uh, you know, two particles can change into three, one or whatever. Um, so, in order for, to, to have uh, well-defined particles that can scatter, I have to talk about separated particles. So, well-separated particles. Separated because by separating them both in space and time, I, um, I can ignore this interaction between them. So, I can consider them relatively free and therefore uh, being able to scatter. So, I consider this uh, states with wave packets that are isolated that are well isolated at t equal minus infinity so before the, um, long before the interaction. Uh, but now, remember, I am interested in tiny planning states. So we're, we were in the Heisenberg picture. Uh, sorry, so, yeah. So, Sorry, so the time independent states, therefore. But, but these states at time equal to minus infinity, so at time equal to minus infinity, they are isolated, but at t around zero or t equal to plus infinity, they interact. So these will be called in states. All right. So the point of view is that this is uh, the point of view of Heinberg is that these are states that are time independent, but when we uh, describe them at t equal minus infinity, we think of them as isolated particles, whereas when we describe them at a finite time, 
we think of them as interacting particles. <coughs> Finite time or time equal to plus infinity as well. Okay. <coughs> So that's why I say these are time independent states because if they would be time dependent, then I could perhaps turn them into something that is also uh, also separated at equal plus infinity. But since they are time independent, I can't. And similarly, then I can consider states that are well isolated at equal plus infinity. And this will be called out states. And the same logic applies. So these states are time independent, but when I describe them at t equal plus infinity, then they're well isolated particles. But when I describe them at finite time or at t equal minus infinity, they are not. So we can we can think of these states. So if I take all possible momenta for this uh, in and out states, they either one of them forms a complete set for the Hilbert space, right? Because I describe all possibilities. If I at initial time I describe all possibilities as states that are well isolated, but with arbitrary momentum, that's a characterization of everything that can be. The same thing at the at the plus infinity. Describe all possible uh, separated states that um, that uh, have arbitrary momentum. So that's the all all possibilities. So that means that both of these states. we're interested in, in most cases. Um, so I pick one of these states that is described as a bunch of non-interacting particles as t equal minus infinity. And then, but then this is a time independent state. And at, uh, I describe it now in, as a sum of all possibilities in terms of states that are independent at t equal plus infinity. There would be amplitudes or probabilities for, uh, for these states to be decomposed as non-interacting states that we can actually measure at t equal plus infinity. <laughs> so the probability amplitude for that would be just the product of these states. Right? So so let's say I have 
I mean, this is not necessary, but this is the, the standard case where I have two initial states, A and B, and several final states, T1, 1, 2, 1, till n. Okay, so this is then the probability, the amplitude to start with this state of um, well separated particles A and B at t equal minus infinity and end up with the state of well separated particles 1, 2 until n, momenta t1 and t2 and so on, at uh, t equal plus infinity. So, uh, now since this is a product, this is uh, this can be described in uh, either um, Schrodinger or um, or. Uh, Heisenberg picture. So I can describe it uh, so this is a state at minus infinity projected into a state at plus infinity and uh, so these are considered as, as time independent states, but if I want to, uh, if I want to uh, move into the uh, Schrodinger picture, I want to describe this as an initial state, K A K B, then propagated with an evolution operator. Ih times 2t until uh, time so from time minus t to time plus t, right? And then project it into the corresponding Schrodinger state. So this in and out they were Heisenberg states. Then these are Schrodinger states. Okay. Uh, so then the S matrix is defined as we said as a uh, matrix element between these Schrodinger states. And then um, and then this is just the um, product of these Heisenberg states in and out states. All right? So uh, so then it means that as an operator, as an operator defined abstractly, the S matrix is uh, just the evolution operator. So until now, I have described things abstractly. So I said, well, we have these well-separated states. But what does that mean? 
to have this well separated state? Well, in general, we have wave functions. And if the states are well separated, I can consider wave functions for each state, and the wave functions should not uh, overlap, or at least not too much, They're exponentially small. Okay? So a one particle state is always isolated. So having an in or out single particle state is kind of a trivial statement. <clears throat> so this is just a state of uh, uh, with a particle of momentum p. So you can think of them as this um, as simply the creation operator for a uh, state with momentum p acting on a vacuum and with some normalization, some relativistic normalization. Uh, and then a state with a wave function is just an integral over, uh, over k when I divide by this uh, normalization and I put some wave function phi of k and then this state k. So this is a one particle state, that's trivial. Uh, and the normalization is of course chosen such that I have this um, the integral over this 5k modulus squared is one. Um, Now this wave function, of course, can be anything in particular. I can have just e to the i k s, or I can have something else, some, some function, some more complicated function. Now, for two particles, this is already um, a little bit uh, more complicated, but so now I have to consider separately the case in and out. And if the particles are well separated, then I can think of them as a product of two of these kinds of states. So I can say that there are two integrals. And then for each one of them, I have such a factor. And then k, k, b. So, so now I cannot, so now I, I put this, these wave function factors, but the, uh, the in state for the two point particle is not anymore something written in terms of one particles. Because as I said, this is a Heisenberg state that at minus infinity is separated, but at plus infinity is not. So I just write it like this. So this, this would be enough. However, uh, usually one also adds um, such a factor e min minus i b times k b, where b is the impact parameter.
having in mind this kind of classical picture of, of, of the Rutherford experiment, where I have a target, um, target A, and then this particle B comes in at an impact parameter B, at a dis minimum distance little b, and then gets deflected or scattered. Um, and uh, yeah, so we want to, to remember that um, there is this variable, the impact parameter associated with this momentum kb. But otherwise, this is not necessary. You see, as I said, <coughs> phi of k can contain things like e to the i k x. So, in particular, phi b can contain such factor e minus i b k b. So I could just reabsorb it in phi b, but um, sometimes it's useful to put it separately. Um, and for the out state, I can also write um, for the out state. I can also write something similarly. Similar. So uh, call them phi one, phi two, and so on. Product of the, over these final states. Of for each, I have such a um, such an integral phi of pf phi f pf to pf and then this uh, out state with given momenta. And here I don't need to separate this. This was just for the initial uh, states in order to remember that there was such a B. But in the final states, I don't see any of that. So I, um, I write just these integrals. <coughs> so then the asymmetric element for states beta, alpha, and beta is just um, uh, is just uh, this product, as I said, and uh, this um, this product was the um, the projection of the state alpha in, which is a state defined over the whole space, but well separated at the initial uh, moment, initial time, into states that are uh, well separated at the final time, beta. But of course, the probability for all possible betas given a state alpha must be still one. So that means uh, total probability is one. So sum over beta is beta alpha squared is 1, which means that this must be a unitary operator. <coughs> okay. So as usual, these amplitudes uh, correspond to unitary operators. Uh, and also, part of this uh, probability is to have the same kind of state come out. So there is a probability that the state didn't, does not interact at all in the middle. So that means that S has to contain the identity, and then there is something else. So that something else that is purely interacting, I call IT. Um, 
Um, and moreover, the amplitudes always have a momentum uh, for momentum conservation, as we saw. So then, the thing that is of more relevance for calculations is not the matrix element of S, but the matrix element of pi t. And moreover, where I take out this momentum conservation delta function. And so I call the remaining object, the, the actual matrix element I'm interested in, I, because I have this I, times M for K A, K B going into this PS. Okay? <clears throat> and so the amplitude I'm really interested in is this M. So it's from this S matrix of projection of uh, in states onto out states, I take out the trivial part, the identity where nothing happens, and then from the matrix element of the remaining uh, object, I take out the momentum conservation delta function. And that resulting M is the amplitude. So this is an amplitude for actual interaction because I take the one out, the amplitude for interaction. Uh, and specifically the amplitude for that momenta k, kb turn into particles with momenta pf. Okay? All right. So finally, has come, we come to the uh, interesting part to relate um, to relate these cross sections. Well, to something that we, we've calculated before. So, right, well, before we get to the cross section, though, let's consider the relation of these matrix elements. So actually, S matrix elements, but what we will actually calculate would be. Uh, M to um, to uh, correlation functions. So the corresponding relation is called the reduction formula by LSD. It stands for Lehmann Simansky. Simansky. the regular S matrix. So I just do this for generality though. Perhaps it's somewhat moot since anyway we're interested in physical things. Um, so let me calculate, let, let me introduce this momentum space uh, correlation function. I separate also initial and final momenta, calling them Kj and Pi. So this is just uh, 
Um, this is just uh, the Fourier transform over these um, external points. So let's say IPI XI product minus IKJ um, YJ of the correlation function, which is uh, time ordered product of the phi's in the two Heisenberg vacuum. Now, with also with this insertion of this operator A, I don't need to, but why not? Also, it's a way of separate, separating um, the incoming and outgoing things. OK, so this is the object that's related to the S matrix. And the specific relation is then that the ace matrix with the insertion of this operator A of 0, the S matrix is otherwise the projection of the initial state K in into the uh, final state P out, now with insertion of A of 0, is related to a residue at a certain pole for, uh, at the massless pole for all external particles. So let's write this as a limit when we go on shell with the external points. And uh, kj squared going to minus n squared. J squared. Right, so I go with all the particle, external particles all the external momenta on shell, right? So note that this is this can only be taken as a limit. So the point is that this Green's function that depends on arbitrary momenta, when I take this uh, momenta on shell, it will go like a pole. So. And uh, correspondingly, so the the, um, the S matrix is uh, the residue at this pole. So that means I have to take out this pole behavior. And what remains will be the S matrix. So in other words, I multiply with these things. There's one more, um, one more uh, trick in here. Actually, I also have some factors of square root z. Well, actually, uh, minus i square root z. So if if I didn't have um, any quantum corrections, the propagator will be minus i over p squared plus m squared. Um, and, uh, and so I have to divide by these things as well. So yeah, I can put this in front, whatever. Yeah, my 1 over minus i z to the n plus n. So 
why uh, this particular formula? Well, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, minus one, minus i squared of z. I should have said. Um, So why this particular formula? Well, if I look at the two-point function or propagator, the two-point function is the, the what replaces the propagator at the quantum level. So it's the, uh, the, the propagator plus quantum corrections. Right? So this would be a function of a single momentum. This propagator, as I said, will have a pole. Now it must be noted that Mi is also quantum corrected in principle. So when I say this, I, I, I really mean that the, the full quantum uh, the full quantum propagator goes like this, as a pole like this. The pole itself might be slightly shifted by quantum corrections from the free pole. But also in, uh, in quantum mechanics, I also get a non-trivial residue, right? So also the thing that is divided by p squared is not one, but uh, is some other function z that starts with one at the, um, at the tree level, and then there's quantum corrections in here. OK? So order g squared. Uh, so, so then these are quantum corrections, that is, loop corrections. And since we will not be, be dealing with loops in uh, this Class loops are left for quantum field theory too. Um, I will not say more, but uh, I will just note. So in here, I, I said that the poles of the endpoint function are of the type i squared z over p squared plus m squared for each external point, and uh, and so correspondingly I divided by minus i squared of z. But of course, the point is that for each, so in here, this is a two-point function, so there are actually two external points, p, right? And so z actually belongs to two external lines. So that's why, so this is square of z times square of z for each external line. That's why, in here, for each external line, I divide by a single square of z factor. All right. And also, I can think of this z as the amplitude modulus squared of the amplitude for uh, to be in a vacuum, in the full quantum vacuum, given a phi of zero acting on a stateless momentum. Um, so, well, I'm, I'm not sure how physical this interpretation is, but otherwise, you can just think of it as a quantum object that uh, um, that appears due to loops in the fall of the propagator. All right, so finally now, the last step is to consider the relation to cross-sections. How do we get How do we get from amplitudes m to cross-section sigma?
All right. So the probability is to go from states A to B to 1, 2, M would be uh, an integral over, over all possible external uh, final momenta. probability which is the absolute value of this S matrix, right? So absolute value squared of this S matrix which is the product of out into in and I put the initial state as phi A phi B, right? States with some wave functions. But the final state I can keep with T1 and T2 if I want to. I mean, it depends how I, how I measure things, but... Uh, so, if I have one target, that is NA equal to 1, and particles per area NB, then number of scattered particles would be integral of this d to b which is I remember now that if I have only one target the, the distance b I mean, or more precisely the vector uh, b perp right? The two, the, this thought as a vector, a two-dimensional vector in a plane transverse to the, um, to the incident direction. So this vector defines the transverse area, right? So particles can come at each, um, each possible b. So by integrating over B, I effectively integrate over the transverse area. And then I multiply this in order to get, uh, to get the number of particles. And, I, and what I integrate over is the probability uh, for this scattering to happen. So this scattering also depends on B because A and B are uh, defined at, uh, <coughs> at the relative uh, impact parameter B. Uh, probability, right? <coughs> okay. Uh, so then, the uh, differential cross section and the differential d sigma would be this delta n scatter divided by n b as we saw. So in the case n a equal to one is number scattered divided by number of incoming particles per area, which gives us an area, right? Then this is integral if this mb is constant, which it usually is. It's a it's a flux that comes out constant, approximately. Then um, I can take mb outside the integral, and then if dividing by it, this uh, cancels. And then left is just integral d to b of p of b. Okay, now. It starts getting complicated, so I'll have to be careful what I keep and what I erase. Uh, that's right. 
here the sigma then is integral uh, no sorry um, Was it not square root two here? Um. I, I, for the moment, I'm a little bit confused about uh, why it's not square root. Let me leave it out. I'll figure it out later. Anyway, then we still have this integral over d to b, which was the impact parameter giving us the integral over area. Then I write this just not to write uh, longer formulas. So there's an integral over k1 and k2, uh, or k a and k b rather, with wave function phi of k i. And um, And since um, yeah, I should have kept somewhere the, or the original formula, let me write it here in a corner. <coughs> IB KB factor and KA KB in. Okay? <coughs> but in the slope, yeah, now I read the other one. And I'm not. Uh, so in here I had I had this uh, matrix element. Right, so absolute value squared of P1, P2, Ka, Kb, um, and then, sorry, phi, phi b, exactly this one, phi a, phi b, given by this. And so what is this absolute value squared? Well, it's this uh, product times its complex conjugate, right, phi a, phi b, or even, yeah, let me even write it as just complex conjugate. Okay, so each of these things, both phi a, phi b, and the one in its complex conjugate, I write as an integral, this factor times uh, k, k, b. So now, when I write this, this sigma, then I have 
the integral over uh, ki with phi i ki, and then also the complex conjugate. So that's another integral that I'll call ki bar, the 2 pi cubed phi i complex conjugate ki bar over square root 2 e bar i. Okay. <clears throat> And then uh, then I would have e to the minus i b k b, and then from the complex conjugate I'll get e to the plus i b k bar b, right? So then all in all I have e to the i b k bar. Uh, B minus KB, and then the matrix element. So P F out with K A K B then this complex conjugate P F B bar A B bar B. Okay. All right. So this is what I want to compute, and now let's uh, let's do um, let's write some various components of this large integral. So first, let me write these matrix elements. As we saw. The S matrix contains a, a trivial part one, which is not uh, included in the way we wrote it in here. So this is just the IP part. So then let's write that PF, KA, KB in. So remember here I have basically 1 plus IP, but 1, as I said, doesn't contribute here. So we're writing only the IT part. And the IT part was written as this momentum conservation delta function. Uh, sum I to AB KI minus sum FPF times this IM. I'll not write m of what because it's clear, but I am. And then this other uh, product with k bars, right? This is the one that will appear as a complex conjugate. Is written similarly 2 pi delta sum i k b k bar i. And uh, well, I might as well put this complex conjugate and then right here minus i and star. Okay. All right. What else can be done easily? Well, one thing that can be done is the integral over b. So I have I have it here. Right? That's the only B dependence that I have. So I have integral B to B equal to I B K bar B minus K B. That's just 2 pi squared. So this is a two-dimensional integral. Right? Remember B is uh, uh, only the transverse to the incoming direction. So 2 pi squared delta squared say kb perp minus k bar b perp. Okay. All right. What else? Well, we have to do this integrals over k and k bar. 
Well, the integral over k will leave it as it is, but we will do the integral over k bar. So, uh, put it here. So I have integral k bar a, integral k bar b. Now we're doing this integral. This, in, in principle, uh, contains this as well. And then I have um, I have the dependence in here, which translates to this, right? And I also have a dependence on k bar in here, which translates into this, all right? So, uh, I will not write down these phi's, although I should. No, maybe let me write it. Yeah, that's easier this way. Yeah, let me write it. the way I read it in my notes is slightly confusing. Let me write it like this and then, but just put this in a bracket. Um, and then I have these delta functions, so delta 4 of uh, some i k bar i minus some f p f, delta 2 k b perp minus k bar b perp. Okay. So the first thing that I do uh, the first thing that I do is to explicitly k bar a plus k bar b minus this okay <clears throat> all right um, and uh, so if I do the integral over and I also should, should write this as integral d to k bar a perp d k a z and this integral d to k b perp d k b z okay so z being the direction uh, along the, uh, the incoming particles and perp means perpendicular to incoming particles. Okay, so now, <coughs> uh, I can, I can do, um,
So I can, I can do the, the integral of the KB per by just killing this and replacing KB bar, uh, sorry, integral of a KB bar per and replace KB bar per with KB per. So in particular, and here I'll have kv perp k bar bz now. Okay? <clears throat> then I can do the integral over ka uh, k bar a uh, k by a perp, sorry. And so now I also replace this with KB perp and K bar BZ. All right. And, um, and I can do the integral over uh, K bar A perp. Yeah, maybe write this specifically. So D two K bar A perp plus K B perp minus some I P F perp. Okay. <coughs> and delta K A bar Z plus K B bar Z minus P F Z. Delta EA bar plus E B bar minus some E F. And um, so I do the integral over K bar A perp. So I, I replace then K perp is kb perp minus some i pf perp. In, partic in particular in here. Uh, and then I'm left with uh, these two delta functions. And these two integrations, right? So I write this as phi a star of well, I'll still write k b a and phi b star k b bar, but I mean with replacements as uh, given by the two delta functions. And then I have these two integrals left, d k b bar z. Um, and d k a bar z. And then these two delta functions, delta of k a bar z plus k b bar z minus some f p f perp p, uh, p f z and delta of e a plus e b bar minus some e f and to do this um, integrals Excuse well me. first yeah why can those guys No, they're not outside. I, um, they're not outside. I just mean, yeah, they're inside. You're right. But I just mean I replace in them uh, the things over there. And here I have delta functions, which will also mean some replacements in them. So I don't care for the moment. I just don't want to write an extremely long formula. Right. 
Um, <clears throat> so uh, I can do directly uh, one of the integrals, let's say this one. So by doing this one, I replace now I replace uh, k bar a z with, well, whatever it's from here. Uh, and then I'm left with this one. So I have this bracket with the phi's, but then I have um, integral d k bar b z delta of <coughs> e a is squared uh, um, um, yeah, square root k, k bar a squared plus m squared plus e b bar is square root k b squared plus m squared, b squared. and then sum over f, e f. And uh, so this is a function of k bar b z. So in here I have k bar b z. Okay, so it's delta, something like delta of an f of x, which as you know is delta of x minus f, x zero, which is the zero of f, divided by absolute value of f prime x zero. Right? So, uh, so I, I want to write this delta function as um, delta of k bar b z minus uh, whatever the thing is zero divided by d of this function divided by d k bar b z. Okay? So I have to differentiate this function with respect to k bar b z. And what do I get? So d uh, and you see it doesn't appear in here nor in here. It only appears in here. So this this is d square root k bar b squared plus m b squared divided by d, so which is, this is db, divided by uh, d um, k bar b z. <clears throat> so this is, well, first of all, when I take uh, this, I get 1 over square root and k, k bar b over square root. The square root is e bar b. And in here, I will get products. Uh, so k bar b z squared, uh, squares plus k bar b perp squared. Um, but this is irrelevant, so the only contribution is from k bar b z, right? So this directive is just k bar b z over e bar b. Uh, oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I, I've been too quick. Um, so this this is also now dependent on on, e, on k bar b because I already. So unfortunately, I, I, the way I wrote it in my notes was was better. <laughs> uh, here I forgot, I, I didn't write what I replaced with, but that's the important part. So the important part is that I replaced, uh, sorry, I replaced k bar per with this, and then k bar a, k bar a z is minus k bar b z plus sum of f p f z, right? 
So in this formula, this is still a function of KBZ. Um, so I have this, but then I also need to calculate the e a, e bar a, divided by d k bar b z. Uh, oh, I switched the two in here. In my notes, I had the opposite. I didn't want to see. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, in my notes, I did first the uh, integral over uh, k. Um, KB and then the integral of KA. Never mind, it's the same thing. So, um, so, so now I have to calculate also the, the derivative of this energy K, uh, oh, this energy E bar A with respect to K bar B Z. So similarly like this, this would be um, the same k bar a z over e bar a um, but uh, and then times d k bar um, a z to d k bar b z but uh, this ratio is minus 1, right? So this is minus k bar a z over e a. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, and then that's it. So the delta function, the delta function is written k bar b z minus its value uh, divided by absolute value of. Of what? Well, we get, um, let's write it specifically. So it's uh, k, k bar b z over uh, e b minus k bar a z over e a, and it's in under the modulus, so I can switch the sign in the in the expression in the middle to coincide with what I have in the notes. Um, <coughs> and then finally, this delta function will be cancelled <coughs> by the last integral over k bar b z. So all in all, I get that the integral I had, so the integral in here is equal to pi star k bar a pi b k bar b where I replace uh, all of these things with the corresponding um, values in terms of a. So uh, in terms of uh, k and kb. And um, the only thing that I am left over with is this one over k bar, um, well, kb, uh, kb z over kb minus k uh, a z over e a, and this thing is called veloc the velocity, so v b, and this is v a. So this whole factor in here is then equal to 1 over Pb minus Ba. So 
that's the relative velocity. All right. So now let's put things together and write the result for this sigma. have this uh, f yeah right so this is uh, momentum over oh, relativistically right I, I write uh, this is m um, mv mv gamma, right? But m gamma is e, right? So this is e v, right? So velocity is momentum divided by. Then, so I, I still have this integral and the integrals over over the original k. So the integrals over k bar were gone, and I replaced k bar with k. And then in here I have square root 2ea to eb, and then here square root 2ea bar a to eb bar. So when I put them to the same, I, I lose the square root. So I have 1 over 2ea to eb. And then I have this factor, eb minus va. <clears throat> uh, then, uh, yeah, and then I have phi of k times phi of k bar, but now it's equal to k star. So this is phi absolute value squared. So phi a of k a absolute value squared. Phi b of k b absolute value squared. And then absolute value of this m for ka, kb going into pf. And uh, yeah, and I'm left with one uh, delta function, which was, um, yeah, which was this one, the overall delta function, right? Two five four delta four of uh, K A plus K B minus some F yeah. All right. Um, so this is the the relevant formula, but now it will also be interesting to to consider the, the physical case where we more or less know the momentum of the incoming pa particle. That's the, that is to say the wave function is peaked uh, very sharply on the momentum. So our case is uh, phi a k a and phi b k b peaked sharply. Um, which amounts basically, so saying that this is delta of Ka minus some Pa, delta of Kb minus Pb. I mean, not quite delta, I should have said, so rather this thing squared should be delta, such that in, eff in effect, we just lose both these integrations and these uh, uh, 
uh, absolute value squared, right? So there were, you know, there was a probability absolute value squared of finding a particle in momentum k is very sharply peaked. Um, so in this case, we get just that d sigma with this integration of a final momenta. And then um, 1 over 2 EA, 2 EB, EB minus DA. And uh, this integral m squared and 2 pi 4 delta 4. Okay? Now, this thing um, this integration over the final momenta with momentum conservation, so the final momenta of a one conservation, this thing is relativistically invariant. And this thing is relativistically invariant. The probability density, uh, absolute value of m squared, is uh, relativistic invariant. But this is not. Right? This is, is written uh, in a way that is not relativistically invariant. I have these energies Ea and Eb. And uh, well, I mean, I can rewrite this in another way. So, E A E B, V A minus V B. So I can write this as um, going back to what I had before. So E B times V B is equal to uh, K B. So this is. Uh, KBZ, so this is uh, um, EBPA KAZ minus uh, EA KBZ. Right? So this is not relativistic invariant. I can write it formally like epsilon mu x y uh, mu x. Uh, y nu of p mu a p mu b or, or k a k mu b but anyway the point is I I have this uh, directions x and y single out or or 0 and z singled out so that's not relativistically invariant right the only way this is relativistically invariant is if the momenta are parallel. So when you measure such B, is you are because you are measuring the momentum of the external momentum. momenta k and kb are parallel so if k 
Ka parallel to Kb, which, by the way, happens in both cases of relevance. So both cases of relevance, this is true. In laboratory frame, uh, Ka was 0. So yeah, it is parallel to anything. And in the center of mass, indeed, K is equal to minus Kb. Right? So in both of these uh, cases of interest, laboratory and central mass frame, this is true. And then uh, I can rewrite this factor as the relativistic invariant object on the web square root P1 dot P2 squared minus M1 squared or M A squared. Right. Uh, again, I got confused by my notation. I decided to call them P and so on. Um, but uh, so so if I replace so if I replace this is really a replacement. Um, this one one over E A E D d minus d a by this one of the squares k k b squared minus m a squared m b squared then this sigma is relativistically invariant so I get a relativistically invariant cross section but you have to remember that this is a theoretical notion. It's not something physical. I mean, it's clear that the cross-section is something where you define what space is, moreover what space transfers to something is. Right? So, by definition, this cannot be relativistically invariant. You can fake it in this way, and that's a very useful theoretical concept. It makes life easier. You can write cross sections in terms of relativistic invariance, but it's not something experimentally measurable. It's only experimentally measurable in the sense that uh, the, the value calculating is correct in both laboratory frame and central mass frame, but it's not relativistic invariance. Uh, Oh, so, so this, this uh, integral factor with the delta function is called pi n. So it's generically denoted by integral d pi n, the relativistically invariant phase space. And uh, so now, um, to understand this better, Consider the case n equal to 2, that is 2 to 2 scattering. Um, and the center of mass and the center of mass frames, that is P total equals 0. So P1 equals minus, minus P2. Um, Um, and then also k1 equal minus k2 or, or rather I should say like this k1 is equal to minus k2 and then delta 3 um, so the, the, the spatial part of the momentum uh, of the momentum conservation is delta of k Ka plus Kb minus P1 minus P2. But this is zero. And so by doing the integration, I just put, so I replace P2 by minus P1. Okay? So then I'm left with 
just the integration over uh, the delta function over energy. So in this case, the space space integral reduces to integral dp1 d4p1 over 2 pi cube two, uh, sorry yes um, um, sorry did 3p1 to pi cubed and then um, I'm left with a 2 pi delta of uh, the conservation of energy gives me, uh, well, the center of mass energy minus C1 minus C2. And then this one I write it as integral over the modulus times P1 squared times P omega. Moreover, I had 1 over 2e1, 2e2. <coughs> and uh, uh, e1 is square root p1 squared plus n squared n1 squared. Right? So again, the delta function is delta of p1 minus. Uh, P1, 0, let's say it like this, uh, divided by the derivative of this with respect to P1, which is uh, P1 over E1. Um, then also in here I have this is for P2 squared plus m squared, but t2 squared is also equal to p1 squared by momentum conservation. So this also gives a contribution, which is uh, the same p1 divided by e2, right? for the same reason as before. Uh, So, the result of our integration, now that I can do the integral of a P1 uh, trivially, is uh, integral over D omega divided by, here I'm left with 2 pi squared, so that is 4 pi squared, times another 4, 16 pi squared. And then P1 squared divided by E1, E2, and then P1 over E1 plus P1 over E2. Uh, that's it. And so I can cancel 1P1 with this. And then the product in here is just P1 plus E2 which is the center of mass energy. So this is integral d omega of 16 pi squared e uh, center of mass energy and p1. Okay? So Finally, we arrive at the fact that in the center of mass frame, d sigma d omega. So remember, I calculated it here d sigma, and then I have an integral of d omega, but if I restrict d sigma to correspond to a given d omega, 
I can divide by it and have this sigma and the omega in the center of mass frame. Uh, so this is for two to two scattering. Right? <clears throat> it's what? This is uh, <laughs> one over two A, two E A, two E B, B A minus B B. This factor that, as I said, could be in principle replaced by this relativistically invariant factor in order to get a relativistically invariant cross section. And then I had this um, uh, phase space integration, integral dt pi 2, which I derived over there. And I got p1 over um, 16 pi squared center of mass and this n for ka kb going to p1 p2 squared okay <clears throat> uh, and moreover it's also useful to consider the case where um, uh, all the particles have the same mass. In this case, uh, momentum conservation, in, uh, is the fact that momenta are the same in opposite directions, while their masses are also the same, means their energies are also the same, because the energy is square root of momentum squared plus n squared. So I have that Ea equal Eb equal E center of mass over 2. But this is also equal to E1 and E2. Uh, and uh, also that all of the momenta are equal. So um, P1 equal to P2 equal to K equal to KB. Um, and And then 2EA, 2EB, VA minus VB. This is 4. Um, as we said, this was uh, EB, KA minus VA, KB. <coughs> but now these energies are the same. Ka minus Kb, and then 4 times Eb, so this is equal to 2 center of mass energy. And then Ka and Kb, Kb are equal and opposite, so this is 2 uh, K, Ka if you want, but also the same as 2 P1. This thing is then 4 e center of mass energy times p1. <coughs> um, so p1 gets cancelled, and then I get a, a, a remaining factor of uh, 4 e center of mass energy. So d sigma d omega center of mass energy is 1 over uh, 64 pi squared e center of mass energy squared times this m squared. And now you see that this center of mass energy squared is uh, a relativistic invariant. Uh, I mean, it's, re it's related to a relativistic invariant, so I can, that will def be defined next time actually. So um, I can write this in a in a very simple uh, um, in a very simple way. Okay. 
Uh, finally, the last thing that uh, I will consider is also the case of particle decay. That's another important case. So, as I said, the most relevant cases are for an in initial um, two particles, which was what we did until now, or an initial one particle, in which case it decays. Um, so, really, yeah, I should have <laughs> kept formulas on Blackboard, but it's not enough space. So, um, we have in our result for the 2 to n scattering, we had integral ka, kb, k bar a, k bar b. And so formally, if I just re erase these things, I would, uh, I would, uh, um, I would just get back to the one to n case, which is a and b. If I drop the b, I just get back to the uh, particle decay case, and of course also drop this phi a modulus squared. But you see, uh, the absence of this integral means that there will be an absence of this uh, kb bar z integral, which gave, gave us this 1 over v b minus v a fact factor. Right? So there was an integral of k bar b z of a delta function that gave us this factor. So that is gone now. And so um, the only thing that we do get is the only thing that we do get is I mean we'll just remain with the delta function for the energy. And then basically um, everything follows. So I can just say that the result, which I also erased, but um, the result is obtained by just removing this VB VA minus VB um, factor, and also this 2EB, because this came from the normalization here. So these factors are also gone. And then EA, the relevant case for particle decay is when it sits as rest. Right? So EA then is MA. That's the relevant uh, case. So, uh, so then this decay rate becomes one of a, I will have two EA, but this is now two MA. Then this uh, this pi n, so the phase space integral, okay, I have the integral d pi n. And just the um, amplitude for this particle at rest with mass ma to go into, to decay into products, uh, into particles, the um, moment of pf. Okay? So that's it. 
the only the only thing that we we must worry about is the interpretation of this thing. Uh, specifically, the reason I say this is because for a particle decay, it's a little bit unclear what it means since the particle is unstable. Um, what does it mean to have uh, asymptotic states? You see? So in the point, in, in the case of scattering, it meant very concrete thing. If you separate the particles a lot, then they don't interact. They stay forever as they are, right? Uh, so the concept of free states makes sense. But this doesn't make sense because now it's only one particle, there's not more. And yet it's still interacting all the time by decaying with certain probability. Right? So the concept of uh, asymptotic state for this A particle is kind of absurd because it keeps interacting. So that's why this, I mean, this is just a yeah, it, it's uh, a replacement that makes sense. So if you uh, consider that this thing makes sense, then you can calculate the probability of decay that agrees with the experiments. But logically, there is something missing here because, uh, well, this, strictly speaking, doesn't fit into the program that we've described with, uh, with non-interacting states um, asymptotically at minus infinity. All right. Okay. So uh, that is all that I wanted to tell you. Do you have any questions? So what specifically is missing? I'm sorry. What specifically is missing is that there is something missing logically. No, no. I mean, <laughs> logically, there is something missing in the formalism, right? That's what I mean. It's 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 uh, the formalism is, is, is in some sense unsatisfactory because just took a formalism for a case that made sense with separated particles and stable and you apply it to a case that doesn't a priori and yet somehow you get the right results. So clearly there should be a better formalism somehow. <laughs> but, um, so if you, if, you, if you were to describe bound states in quantum theory, how, how then you test the procedure? Because you mean bound states, bound states yeah. in, in, a, in a potential or? or or what? Or in bound states in the scattering? In the realm of quantum field theory, for example, is it something like that? I don't know. No, no, but I mean, there are two kinds of things that could be called bound states. One is for a particle in a potential, right? I mean, the hydrogen atom is an example, right? And that's not the problem describing that. Uh, the other one is uh, bound states, bound but unstable states, right? In, in a scattering. In a scattering statement, in a scattering situation, you can have some uh, bound states that can appear at some poles in the amplitude. Right? That's more in line with this one, but with, with what but, I said. But what's the procedure then? Because in order to get healthy, I, I started the shredding Well, I mean, if you want to describe it as a time independent state with the Schrodinger equation, but otherwise, what you're seeing is, as I said, if you're looking at the state from the point of view of a scattering, which is people, what, what people look in experiments, right? They scatter something, and maybe they see a, a peak of somewhere, and they say, well, maybe this is to some, due to some uh, bound state that appears, right? Um, but, uh, but yeah, in this case, the formula is still scattering, so it's still somewhat uh, uh, unsatisfactory at some level, yeah. yeah. I haven't read about, but uh, that's a bigger equation that you can describe possibly. But I didn't, I don't know, you know something about it. Well, yeah, yeah, but I mean, again, it depends what, what, you're, what you want to describe, right? So, so if you want to describe, let's say, a, a traditional bound state in a, in, a, in a potential, 
then um, then you can you can find a more regular, rigorous formalism. Right? You can describe that potential and try to co compute quantum corrections and so on. But if you want to describe it in terms of a scattering, then um, you can write something formal and you know calculate the bound state. What I'm saying is the uh, interpretation, like in this case, it's, it's a little bit uh, un unsatisfactory because the thing is not asymptotic. It doesn't really exist for an infinite amount of time. It's the same problem. You have no right to, 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 to define it as if it were uh, a time-independent Schrodinger equation. Because it's not. It's, it's in the, it decays in time. So. You see? All right. Good. So then that's it for today's lecture. And I'll see you on Monday. Please give me.